Good morning, my dear friends. Today is uh, Thursday, September the 29th, in the year 2011. We are on our second day of uh, the retreat, cultivating the mind of love. And this practice center is called uh, Magnolia Grove uh, Meditation Practice Center. When you love someone, You want to offer him or her something, something beautiful, something that you are sure he will like or she will like. And what is the best thing you can offer him or her when we love him or her so much? That is my question. Maybe you think that you can go to the supermarket and buy something. But that may not be the best thing you can offer him or her. We should think a little bit more about that. What is the most precious thing that you can offer him or her, the person he loves so much? I know a young man of 11. He's not happy. His father is very rich. His father is a businessman, having a lot of money. And yet, uh, everything that his father gave him did not make him happy. His father is extremely rich and he could afford to buy anything for his son. But the young man did not seem to need anything at all. He was unhappy because his father is so busy. When you are a businessman like that, you do not have the time for yourself, for your wife, for your children. And that is why the young man was unhappy. His father did not have the time for him, for his mother. And that is why that morning the, the father, the gentleman asked him, My son, tomorrow will be your birthday, that's right. What do you want? I will buy it for you. But the young man did not know what to answer because he did not need anything. Even an electric uh, train or a scooter, motorbike. But after some reflection, he found out the answer. Daddy, it's you that I want. Because his father is so busy, he's caught up with his uh, business. He thinks too much about the stock markets and things like that. And he could not have enough time for himself, for his wife and his uh, son. Daddy, that's you that I want. I want your presence. 
No, he has a fa- he had a father. He has a father, but he does not feel that he has a father, because his father is not available to him. So if his father has gone and practiced mindfulness, he would know what to do. He would uh, go back to his uh, breathing and breathing in mindfully, breathing out mindfully, bringing his mind home to his body and become fully present. And then his father would look at, into the eyes of his son and say, Darling, my son, I'm here for you. And that is the best kind of gift, That's the, the, the best kind of present that you can make to your beloved one. So according to this practice, the best present you can make to your beloved one is your true presence. You have to be there. I'd like to ask you a question. How can you love if you are not there? To love means to be there. And the practice of mindfulness can help you to be truly there in the here and the now for your beloved one. And it's not difficult. You need only to breathe in mindfully and bring your mind home to your body and stop all your thinking and suddenly you are there, mind and body together. And you have something very precious to offer him or her. And that is why the first mantra that we practice in Plum Lish is, Darling, I'm here for you. And you do not have to practice it in Sanskrit or Tibetan. You can practice it in English. <laughs> Darling, I'm here for you. But in order to be there, you have to practice. You have to stop your thinking about the past, about the future. You have to stop your projects, your worries, your anger. You have to ride on your in-breath to go home to yourself. And that may take only three or four seconds for you to stop your thinking and bring your mind home to your body and become fully present. And you can go to him or to her and look into his eyes or her eyes and pronounce the first mantra. Darling, I'm here for you. Because you are truly there, that is why the mantra is real. If you are not there, the mantra will not work. But if you are truly there, mind and body together, I assure you that the mantra will work. And that will make the other person happy. And the most wonderful thing is that even if that that person is not physically in front of you, you can still practice. You can use your mobile telephone. (laughs) And breathing in and out mindfully, you compose the number. And when you hear his voice, and you practice the mantra, Daddy, I know you are there. I am here for you. I am truly here for you, or mommy, or anyone that you love. And the first mantra is, uh, Darling, I am here for you. And we should all memorize that mantra in order to practice. If we are a lover, if we truly love someone, we have to be there for him or for her. And that is not too difficult. That is meditation. That's not difficult. It does not take time. It does not take money. We need only one thing, mindfulness. Because mindfulness helps you to be there, fully alive, fully present. And with that true presence, we can offer to our beloved one. About 30 years ago, in a retreat organized for children in Santa Barbara, Northern California, 
we begin to teach our children Bible meditation. And the children love it, Bible meditation. And the adults love it too. And in order to practice uh, Bible meditation, you should go and pick up four pebbles and clean them and dry them and put into a small bag like this. Bible meditation is designed for children, but adults, they love it. Many of them practice. And the practice of Bible meditation makes us uh, fresh, peaceful, beautiful, pleasant, so that we can offer our freshness, our beauty, our peace to the person we love. Because uh, the practice of uh, mindfulness helps us to be fresh, help us to be peaceful, help us to be stable, solid, help us to be free. And if you are fresh, you are solid, you are calm, and then our presence has a value, and we can offer that beautiful presence to our beloved one. When a group of uh, children sit in a circle to begin Bible meditation, they, they take uh, the Bible out and they put it on the left. And with uh, the right hand, they pick up the first Bible and they look at for one or two seconds. The first Bible represents uh, a flower. It takes only one or two seconds in order to recognize the first pebble representing a flower. And you put it on the palm of your left hand, and you put your left hand on your right hand, and you begin to practice. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. Breathing out, I feel fresh. Flower, fresh, three times. And this morning, we practiced that during a sitting meditation led by Brother Pap Khoi. We need to breathe in and out three times in order to restore our freshness, our flowerness. Because each of us is born as a flower, a flower in the garden of humanity. Every child is beautiful as a flower. I like to sit with the children. I like to do walking meditation with children. They offer me a lot of uh, freshness and beauty. And we adults, we were born also as flowers. And a number of us know how to preserve our flowerness if we know the practice, and then we can preserve our flowerness, our, our freshness for a long time. And with that flowerness and freshness, we can offer it to the person we love. But some of us do not know how to preserve our freshness, our flowerness. And that is why we don't have much to offer to our beloved one. That is why meditation, the practice of mindfulness, can help us restore our flowerness, our beauty, our freshness. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. You don't have to imagine that you, have a, you are a flower. You are a real flower, a kind of flower. A human being is beautiful. Look at a child. Her face is a real flower, very pleasant to look at. His hand is true flower. His tiny hand is a real flower. 
and his small foot is a real flower. And when the small child sleeps, he is beautiful. And when the child uh, plays, she is beautiful. She is really a flower. And uh, we are doubt. We want to preserve our flowerness, our freshness, our <coughs> innocence, because that makes us more beautiful, more pleasant, so that we can offer it to our beloved one. If you have cried a little bit too much, your eyes may be less than flowers now. But with the practice, you can restore your flowerness, and your eyes will shine again, will be fresh again. It takes a few days. <laughs> and then you have something to, uh, to offer to the person you love. Yeah, you know? People who are above 80, like myself, we can still preserve our freshness, our flowerness. And we can smile with our eyes also. And we still can have a lot in order to offer to the people we love. And that is the value, uh, the function of uh, the practice of mindfulness. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. I don't imagine, I don't have to imagine. I was a flower and I can still be a flower with the practice. Breathing in, I enjoy my in-breath, and I restore my flowerness, my freshness. I don't allow my tension, my worry to overwhelm me. I release my tension, I release my worry, and I become a flower again. That is the miracle of uh, the practice of mindfulness. And I'm sure that after having breathed in and out three times and restore your freshness, you become, you feel much better and you become more pleasant. And then after that, you take the pebble flower and you put on your leg. And then you pick up the second one that represents uh, a mountain. Believe it or not, there is a mountain in every one of us. We can be solid if we know how to sit, how to work. And this uh, second Bible helps us to cultivate our stability, our solidity. That is the element mountain in us. We are beautiful, fresh like a flower, but we can be stable and solid like a mountain. If we know how to walk, how to sit in the present moment. People who are not stable, you can, we, we cannot count on them. And that is why you have to be solid, you have to be stable, and your presence will be a gift to him or to her. And that is why Practicing the second pebble help you to be more stable, more solid. A person who is not stable cannot be a happy person. And that's why cultivating stability is very important. Helping the mountain in us <coughs> to manifest. You know, sitting in the lotus position can make you feel stable and solid. And walk in meditation, you feel much more solid. And if you know how to combine your breathing and your sitting, you become more stable and more solid. And then you have something precious to offer to him or to her, your beloved one. Breathing in, I see myself as a mountain. Breathing out, I am solid. 
I feel solid three times. And then the next uh, pebble would be Zen. Still water. Water. A lake that is completely still can reflect the sky, the mountain, the trees, the cloud as they are. And you can aim your, your camera at the water and you take a picture of the sky. And people who are calm, people who are peaceful, they are happy people. If you are not calm, you cannot be a happy person. That is why practicing, practice, to practice in order to become more calm, calmer, more peaceful, is possible. Sitting meditation, walking meditation, breathing in and out can help you to restore your peace, your calm. And then you can offer that to your beloved one. Breathing in, I see myself as still water. Breathing out, I reflect things as they truly are. Because if you are not calm, you don't see things as they are. You have a wrong, a lot of wrong perceptions that give you a lot of anger, fear. That is why we should cultivate our peace of calm. If we are calm and peaceful, we reflect things as they are. We don't imagine. We do not become victims of our wrong perceptions. And we know that anger, fear, despair, violence, hate, all these things are born from wrong perceptions. The terrorists, they have a lot of wrong perceptions. That is why they want to kill want to destroy. And we have to help them to remove uh, the wrong perceptions in them, help them to be calm, to be more peaceful. The last pebble represents uh, space. You look at it for one or two seconds and recognize it as representing space. Breathing in, I see myself as space. Breathing out, I feel free. This meditation helps you to get a lot of space into your heart. If you have too much worries, too much fear, too much craving, there is hardly no space in your heart. You cannot be a happy person. That is why you have to put a lot of space into your heart. When you look up at the sky and contemplate the full moon, you see the full moon sailing across the sky, very beautiful, because the full moon has a lot of space around her. A happy person is like that. She has a lot of space in her heart and a lot of space around her. And when you have a lot of space like that, you are a happy person and you can offer that spaceness, that freedom to the person you love. If you really love someone, offer him some space. Offer her some space in her heart and around her. Do not impose your ideas on him or on her to offer freedom, that's true love. And that can be cultivated by the practice of uh, mindfulness. <coughs> Breathing in, I see myself as space. There is an immensity within myself. If we do not have space, freedom, we cannot be a happy person. And when we have uh, a lot of freedom, we can make our beloved one happy also by offering him or her 
space and freedom. And after having practiced three times, breathing in and out, and having more space, you put it on your right, and you have finished your pebble meditation. And a, a boy, a little boy or a little girl can very well lead a session of pebble meditation. You sit in a circle of five or six, and one of you will take care. Take take charge of the bell, inviting the bell. You begin the session with three sounds of the bell, and everyone enjoy breathing in and out three times. And then you, you begin to practice pebble meditation. So today you might like to, um, to select, to go out and find out your four pebbles. And you may like to make a small bag like this. <coughs> Before that, you can keep them in your pocket. <laughs> and tomorrow, you may like to show us how to do it, right? How to invite the bell, and how to sing the song, I am fresh as a flower, I am solid as a mountain. So when you hear the small bell, uh, please stand up. I mean the young ones. And bow to the Sangha before you go out and continue your learning and practice outside with young monks and nuns. Turn around and bow to the Sangha. Have a good day. This morning we um, we practice uh, guided meditation, and we tried uh, the first four exercises recommended by the Buddha. In the sutra, in the text of uh, Anapanasati Sutta. The Buddha proposed uh, 16, 16 exercises on mindful breathing. And the first four have to do with our body. And the first exercise is breathing in. I know this is uh, my in breath. Breathing out, I know that this is my out breath. So the first um, exercise is to recognize your in-breath and your out-breath, to identify our in-breath as an in-breath and our breath as an out-breath, to recognize, to identify the in-breath and the out-breath. Exercise number one, to identify our in-breath and our out-breath. The exercise is very simple, but the effect might be great. Because when you, when you focus your attention on your in-breath, and you really focus your attention on it, you release the past, you release the future. You might have a regret or sorrow concerning the past. And the past may have become a kind of prison. And you like to go back to that prison and suffer. And those of us who 
are not capable of living in the present moment. We always think of the past and we suffer. And then those of us who are prisoners of the future, we are not capable of living in the present moment. We continue to worry, to be fearful about the future. The future becomes a kind of prison. We are not free. And that is why we have to cultivate the capacity to be free in order to live every moment of our daily life more deeply. And in order to do that, we have to go back to the present moment. And breathing in and focusing your attention on your in-breath help you to release the past, release the future, release your projects, and bring your mind home to your body. And you, you are there establish in the here and the now. So just breathing in mindfully set you free, free from the past, from the future. A person without freedom cannot be a happy person. And freedom can be got just by breathing in. You release the past, you release the future, you are in the here and the now, and you can touch the wonders of life in you and around you. So the exercise looks very simple. And yet, if you are a good practitioner, that exercise can bring you a lot of freedom of happiness. The second exercise proposed by the Buddha is uh, breathing in. I follow my in-breath from the beginning to the end. Breathing in, I follow my in-breath all the way through. And the and the time for your in-breath may last three, four, five, six seconds. But during that time, there is no interruption. Even for one millisecond, you follow your in-breath, you focus totally your mind on your in-breath from the beginning to the end. Half the in-breath, you don't stop and say, Oh, I forgot to turn off my, the light in my room. <laughs> you don't allow that kind of interruption to happen. You are aware of your in-breath from the beginning to the end. And during the time of breathing in, you cultivate concentration. There is some concentration in mindfulness already. But if you are very mindful, truly mindful, and then concentration will be built up. And concentration helps mindfulness to be deeper. Mindfulness brings concentration, and concentration helps mindfulness to be deeper. Breathing in, I follow my in-breath from the beginning to the end. Breathing out, I follow my out breath from the beginning to the end. Suppose the marker is my <coughs> in breath, and this finger is my mind. I begin to breathe in, and my mind is fully, is with my in breath all the way through. So that is the way you cultivate mindfulness and concentration. And you enjoy more your in-breath and out-breath. And your freedom becomes uh, more long-lasting. And you can enjoy also. Because breathing in and breathing out, 
and to follow your in breath, out breath is not hard labor. You don't have to suffer breathing in or breathing out. In fact, you might enjoy breathing in. I enjoy my in-breath from the beginning to the end. And breathing like that is very healing and nourishing. And that is why, although it looks simple, but the effect can be very uh, great. And we can practice like that in the sitting position, in the walking position, in the lying position, in the standing position. Holding your plate, standing in line to serve uh, breakfast, you enjoy your in breath and out breath. There's time to enjoy the practice. You don't need to go to the meditation hall and sit down and not to, to breathe. So, the second exercise of mindful breathing is to follow. your in-breath and out-breath. The third, breathing in, I'm aware of my body. So this is awareness of body. In a state of, uh, of uh, destruction, mind and body are not together. Our body is here, but our mind is elsewhere. In the past, in the future, in our projects, caught by anger, caught by fear. So mind and body are not together. We are not truly there. We are not living our life truly. So this exercise is to bring the mind home to the body and to restore your oneness of body and mind. The, the mind becomes the embodied mind and make you alive and it can help you to get in touch with your body. Your body is a wonder. And when your mind is back to your body and recognize your body, you are truly there and you can begin to live truly your life. Many of us live in a virtual life. Suppose you work, uh, you, are, you, you, you are with your computer. Hmm. You may get lost completely in the virtual uh, world of the computer. You forget that you have a body. You forget that the planet Earth is there with all the wonders. <laughs> you do not live in reality. And many of us have to spend so many hours in that world. On the 14th of uh, September, our Sangha went to uh, Northern California and practiced one day with the people uh, at the Google Center. <laughs> All the Googlers were, <laughs> came together and we practiced uh, guided meditation, sitting meditation, walking meditation, mindful eating, and so on. Total relaxation also. 
and many rulers try for the first time live with the deeply with the body, with the breath, and become aware of every breath, every step. Because most of them work uh, more than 15 hours a day with their computer. And they do not have uh, a lot of chance to go back to their body, to be with their body, and to feel the presence of their body and the presence of the environment around them. So the third exercise is to come home to the body and feel the presence of the body and to be to become truly alive. You cannot be truly alive without your body. So this is a kind of reconciliation between the mind and the body. You go home and be with your body and take good care of your body. And when you you come home to your body, you might notice that your body suffers. There may be a lot of uh, tension and pain in your body. In fact, many of us have allowed tension to be accumulated into our body. And the pain continues to grow, to become chronic pain. And that is why the Buddha proposed the fourth exercise, breathing in, I release the tension from my body. Release tension. In body. So this teaching, this practice is still very relevant to our time. Riding on our in-breath, we come home to our body. We feel the presence of our body and we release, we allow our body to release uh, the tension. And when tension can be released, well, we can reduce the amount of pain in our body. Because pain in the body is in function of uh, the tension. And when the body is relaxed. It, it has the capacity of uh, healing itself. The body has a natural capacity to heal itself. If we allow our body to rest and to release the tension. Many of us count only on medicines. And we don't know that uh, the basic practice to heal is to allow our body to relax. Let us think about the animals living in a mountain. They still have that wisdom. When an animal is deeply wounded, she knows how to, what to do. The animal looks for a quiet place and lay down. Does not think of uh, getting something to eat. Does not think of running after another animal. That is the wisdom they still have. They look for a quiet place and sit down and lay down. And they know that that's the only way to heal. They don't have a doctor, they don't have a pharmacist. And they know that's the best way. And three, four days later, they get healed. And they begin to stand up and go and look for some food. 
we humans, we used to have that kind of wisdom also, but now we have lost them. We now only count on medicines. We don't know that helping the body to relax and to rest is uh, giving the body the capacity to heal itself. Even if you have a vacation, holidays, we don't know how to rest anymore. And after the vacation, uh, after the holidays, <laughs> you get more tired. <laughs> so we have to relearn how to rest. And this uh, practice help us. We should learn how to rest again. There is a text uh, on uh, the contemplation of the body in the body, a sutra on the contemplation of the body. And the Buddha gave an, gave an example. A farmer goes up to the attic and uh, brings down a bag of seeds. And he opened one end of the bag and allowed all the seeds in the bag to flow on the floor on the wooden floor. And with <coughs> eyes still in good condition, he recognized every kind of seed. This is uh, kidney beans, this is corn, this is uh, mung beans, etc. So the practitioner does exactly like that. She may lay down and she begins to breathe in and recognize eyes, nose, tongue, body, lungs, heart, kidneys, liver, feet, and so on. So you practice mindfulness of breathing and you revisit all part of your body. Breathing in, I'm aware of my eyes. Breathing out, I smile to my eyes. I recognize the presence of my eyes. Breathing in mindfully, I generate the energy of mindfulness. And with that energy, I recognize my eyes as existing. I embrace my eyes with the energy of mindfulness. And my, I might get the insight that my eyes are true conditions of happiness. And I might notice that my eyes are still in good conditions. And I get insight that I need only to open my eyes in order to get in touch with the, a paradise of forms and colors that is available in the here and the now. Because, because of the fact that my eyes are still in good condition, the kingdom of God is available. A paradise of forms and colors is available. And I recognize one of the many conditions of happiness that I am having. So breathing in, I am aware of my eyes. Breathing out, I smile to my eyes. And you go down. You become aware of your ears, your nose, your tongue. And you visit all part of your body with the practice of mindful breathing. It's less like scanning the body, not with uh, a scanner, with x-rays, <laughs> but with the ray of mindfulness. You recognize the presence of every part of your body breathing in, and you smile to it with compassion. <coughs> you might have not been, you may have not been very kind to that part of your body. 
Breathing in, I'm aware of my heart. Breathe now, I smile to my heart. And compassion may arise from that kind of exercise. Compassion and great gratitude because my heart, she functions day and night non-stop to nourish all the cells in my body. And yet I have not supported her. Smoking, drinking alcohol, staying late in the night, uh, things that are not very friendly to our heart. And when you recognize your heart, and you smile to your heart, compassion, understanding my arise, and you know how to behave in order not to give your heart a hard time. <laughs> and you might notice that your heart still functions normally. And that is something great because there are those of us who do not have a, a heart like that. And our deepest desire is to have a normal heart. And yet we have a heart like that, but we don't enjoy, we don't appreciate. We are giving our heart a difficult time by smoking, by drinking alcohol, and so on. And the same thing is true with our liver. Breathing in, I'm aware of my liver. Breathing out, I smile to my liver. My liver might be sending me a message, S-O-S, S-O-S. <laughs> but I continue to drink alcohol. I continue to eat a lot of fat. So listening to your body with compassion, visiting all parts of your body, that is the practice recommended by the Buddha. And when you come to a place, to an organ that is ailing, you might like to stay longer with it, embracing it tenderly with your breathing in and out mindfully, you will help that part to heal more quickly. Let us not count only on medicines. With this practice recommended by the Buddha, we can help, we can allow our body to heal itself. We hold that uh, ailing part of the body like holding a wounded cat with compassion. And that will help with the healing. The fifth exercise is to generate, to bring in a feeling of joy. Generating joy. The sixth is generating happiness. The seventh is to recognize a painful feeling. And the eighth is to embrace a painful feeling. So we are now in the domain, in the realm of feelings. And the four, the four exercises, the four exercises are to handle, are to help us to handle our feelings. Of course, there are painful feelings, there are painful emotions. And we as practitioners, we should learn how to handle a painful feeling. If you don't know how to handle a painful feeling, you are not a good practitioner yet. If there is a strong emotion, 
painful emotion, we should know how to handle that emotion, like fear, anger, despair. And this can be done with the practice of mindful breathing. But before teaching us how to handle pain, the Buddha proposed that we learn how to generate a pleasant feeling, a joyful feeling, a happy feeling. And uh, this practice helps us, because as a good practitioner, you are supposed to be able to bring in a joyful feeling whenever you like. And this with the practice of mindful breathing. When we focus our attention on our in-breath and breathe in, we bring our mind home to our body and uh, we establish ourselves in the here and the now. And in the here and the now, we may recognize the many conditions of happiness that are already available. These conditions of happiness are in us and around us more than enough for us to be joyful and happy. In fact, we are very lucky. We still have many conditions of joy and happiness available. But because we get lost in the past and the future, in our worries and our fear, that is why we do not recognize them. We believe that it is impossible to be happy now. We have to go to the future and look for some more conditions of happiness. That's the way we think. But the Buddha said very clearly that if you go home to the here and the now, you recognize that conditions for your happiness are plenty already. And you can be happy right here and right now. And that is the teaching called Drista Dharma Sukha Vihara, living happily in the present moment. This the Dharma Sukha Vihara. Hiền Pháp Lạc Trú. Vihara means dwelling, living. Sukha. Happy happiness. This Lama present moment. You can dwell, you can live happily right in the present moment. This expression, Drista Dhamma Sukha Vihara, is found four times in a discourse that the Buddha gave to a group of businessmen. <laughs> You know that at the time of Buddha, there was a very um, well-known businessman whose name is Anatta Penika. He is uh, very appreciated by the people in his uh, country, the country of Shravasti, because he, um, he devoted uh, a lot of his time and money to, uh, to help the, the poor the lonely people in the city. And that is why uh, people in the city of Shravasti gave him that beautiful name, Anatta Pinika, the one who takes care of the destitute people, of the lonely people, orphans, uh, widows, and so on. His real name is uh, Sudatta. Uh, during one of his visits to the city of Rajagraha, he discovered the Buddha in the Sangha. 
and became a student of the Buddha. And he invited the Buddha to come to his country and to teach. And when the Buddha agreed, he went home and bought a park. And off, uh, with intention to offer it to the Buddha as a practice center. It's like a magnolia. Uh, there was one time when uh, Anatta Pinika went bankruptcy. bankruptcy. But he did not suffer because he had so many friends that came to help him restore his business. And he had a great deal of pleasure, happiness, serving the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So one day he brought many hundreds of his colleagues, all businessmen, to come to the Buddha, and the Buddha gave them that discourse. And in that discourse, the expression, living happily in the here and the now, was repeated five times. I think the Buddha knew that businessmen think a little bit too much about the future, <laughs> about their success. They don't have enough time to enjoy the here and the now. They overlook the present moment. They think they need more success in order to be happy. And therefore, he gave that discourse. Gentlemen, you can be happy right here and right now. And with the practice of uh, mindfulness, you can go home to the here and the now and recognize the fact that you are very lucky. You have more than enough condition to be happy. Today is a French song. Qu'est-ce qu'on attend pour être heureux? Why do you have to wait? You can be happy right now. And every every time we have a, a retreat, French speaking for French speaking people, you always sing that song. <laughs> <laughs> so if we take a piece of paper and write down the conditions of happiness that we already have, we will find out that one page is not enough. Two pages are not enough. Three pages are not enough. We have a lot of conditions of happiness, beginning with our eyes. Since we have eyes still in good condition, the paradise of forms and colors is available. We just sit on the grass and enjoy the paradise. Why do we have to run into the future looking for more conditions of happiness? We have more than enough. And that is why to generate a feeling of joy, to generate a feeling of happiness is always possible at any time. And a good practitioner, by going home to the here and the now, can recognize the many conditions of happiness. And she can be happy all day long, and make the people happy all day long also. Because as a practitioner, we can remind people that this is a time to be happy. And in this uh, civilization, many people are looking for happiness in the future elsewhere. And that is why this practice uh, will help our society. So mindfulness, mindfulness uh, written in Chinese is like this. This is the present moment, Kim. And uh, this is uh, the mind, present moment, mind. The mind going home to the present moment means mindfulness. 
Smriti. In Sanskrit, Sati in Pali. And mindfulness is the kind of energy that helps us to go home to the here and now and recognize conditions of joy and happiness that are available. And in the Sutra, there is a depression that mindfulness is the source give birth to joy. and to happiness, niệm sinh hi la. The joy and the happiness born from mindfulness. And that is why, as a practitioner, we can say with confidence is mindfulness is a source of joy and happiness. And mindfulness can be generated by our practice. Mindfulness is not something we can buy in a supermarket. And when we have the collective energy of mindfulness, we can nourish ourselves, our family, our community. There is not a factor that can bring happiness and joy, that is concentration. When you drink a cup of tea, you may choose to drink it with concentration, mindfulness and concentration. When you are mindful, your mind is with your body. You are truly there. You are real. You become real. And when you become real and true, something else will become real and true, that is life. Otherwise, life will be only a ghost, a phantom. And you are a phantom if your mind is not with your body. If you are real and life become real. So the cup of tea, part of life, become real, and you drink your tea in concentration, and you appreciate the tea, you enjoy the tea. If you are not concentrated, if you look at uh, the television, if you listen to the music, and then the tea is lost. So concentration can be an element a condition of happiness. And when we practice walking meditation, if you are really concentrated on every step, we touch the kingdom of God with every step and happiness becomes possible. So mindfulness and concentration are the two sources of uh, happiness. And we can afford to draw from happiness from these uh, sources. And we can generate the energy of mindfulness and concentration with our practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking. The Buddha recommend another, uh, another method of generating joy and happiness. That is the practice of letting go, releasing. There are things that we use to to see as essential to our happiness, to our well-being, to our security. We cannot let them go. And maybe they are obstacle for our happiness. If we have the courage to let go, 
and then happiness and joy will come naturally. And we have to learn how to release these things. And you may like to take a piece of paper and write down these, uh, the things that you can let go. One time the Buddha was sitting with his monks having lunch together. And a farmer came by, very unhappy. He asked, Monks, did you see my cows passing over here? And the Buddha said, what cows? I have three cows. And I don't know why this morning they all, they, they have all run away. And I have two acres of sesame seed. And this year, the insect ate them all. Dear Venerables, I think I'm going to kill myself. I have nothing left. The Buddha said, Dear friend, we have not seen your cows uh, crossing over here. Maybe you should go and look for them on the other direction. And when the, monk, when the farmer is gone, the Buddha turned to his monks and smiled. And he said, dear friends, you are very lucky because you don't have any cow to lose. (laughs) (laughs) So if we have cows, we know that maybe these cows are an obstacle for our happiness. We have to to write down the name of our cows on a sheet of paper (laughs) and see whether we can release them or not. because they may be an obstacle for our happiness. Our idea of happiness may be a cow. We may believe that happiness is impossible until I get that, or happiness is not possible until I get rid of this. You may have ideas like that, and that idea may be the main obstacle for, for your for your happiness. You know, the Soviet Union was caught by an idea during 70 years that the only way to make the country strong is uh, communism, is Marxism. And anyone who voices an idea that is contradicted to that will be put in prison. And you might entertain an idea of happiness for 70 years. And wait to wait 70 years to release an idea is too long. So you may have been, you may have entertained your idea of happiness for more than three years. It may be the obstacle of of your happiness. So look at it again to see whether it is a cow that you can let go. And if you can let go of that idea of happiness, happiness will come right away. Please uh, call your cows by their two names. (laughs) And have the courage to let them go. So letting go is a good practice. It's not because we acquire more and more that we can be happy. It is by letting go that we become happier and happier. Living in a crowded and polluted city with 10 10 million people, you suffer because of the noise, of the dust, of the pollution. But you don't have the courage to get out of the city for a weekend to go to the countryside. Because you think that you, are, you have so many important things to do. 
But if you can get out of the city, and then after one hour, you come in touch with uh, the rolling hills, the full moon, the blue sky, the beach, the river, and your happiness, the happiness you are experiencing now, is to the, due to the fact that you have had the courage to leave the city behind. So to let go is one of the ways to generate joy and happiness. And this is the teaching of the Buddha. And the teaching is still um, relevant to our time. And then when we have enough joy and happiness, maybe we are stronger in order to handle the block of pain, sorrow, fear in us. I think this, uh, this um, is a very scientific way uh, of approaching feelings. Because uh, if a doctor judges that a patient is too weak, he would not allow surgery to take place away, uh, right away. The patient should, be, should, re, should acquire some kind of um, uh, strength in order to undergo a surgery. And this is the same here. Maybe we need some nourishment with joy and happiness before we can handle the block of pain and sorrow in us. That is why the fifth and the sixth uh, exercise go first, and then the seventh come later. Many of us are afraid of going home and getting in touch with the pain inside. We are afraid of being overwhelmed by the pain. That is why our practice is to run away from our pain. But the Buddha recommends the opposite. Go home and take care of your pain. And you can do that without fear because now you have uh, you know how to generate energy of mindfulness and concentration. And you are strong enough to go home to yourself, to recognize the pain in yourself and listen to it and transform it. Hello, my little pain. Hello, my little anger. I know you are there. I'm home to take care of you. I do not want to cover you up with uh, consumption anymore. We consume not because we need to consume. We eat, we watch television, we have a conversation, not because we need to do them, but because we don't want to go home and touch the suffering inside. So even if the television program is not interesting enough, we do not have the courage to turn it off because we are afraid that we have to get in touch with the suffering. So the practice of mindful breathing, the practice of mindful um, walking can help generate that uh, energy of mindfulness so that we can go home to us, recognize and embrace our pain and heal. That is the teaching of the Buddha. The basic uh, practice is mindful breathing, mindful walking. And if we are a beginner in the practice, we can also rely on the collective energy of mindfulness generated by the Sangha. You sit among your brothers and sisters in the practice. You allow yourself to be embraced like a drop of water allowed herself to be embraced and transported by the river. Dear brothers, dear sisters, here is my pain, here is my despair. Please help recognize, embrace it. Alone, my mindfulness and concentration is not strong enough for me to do that. So that is why practicing with the Sangha is very important when your mindfulness is not solid enough. 
And that is why taking refuge in the Sangha is not a, a declaration of faith. It is a practice. You belong to a Sangha. You know how to make good use of the collective energy of mindfulness in order to embrace your pain and sorrow. And those of us who know that you have pain and sorrow, we sit there, we breathe, we help embrace your pain and sorrow because you are a Dharma sister, a Dharma brother to us. So when the pain manifests as a a source of energy, a block of energy, a good practitioner begins to recognize, begin to practice mindful breathing, mindful working, to generate the second source of energy. That is uh, the energy of mindfulness and concentration. And with that second source of energy, the practitioner recognizes the first source of energy, pain, sorrow, fear. My dear little fear, I know you are there. I will not run away. I am back to take care of you. That is the seventh exercise, recognizing the painful feeling, the painful emotion. And the eighth is to embrace, because you have enough of that uh, energy to embrace the pain, the sorrow. When a mother hears the cries of the baby, she put anything she's holding down, she goes to the baby's room and pick the baby up and hold the baby like this tenderly. So as a practitioner, we do exactly the same thing. The pain, the sorrow in us is our baby. We should not try to run away from it. We have to be there for our baby. We have to recognize it. And the mother does not know what is wrong with the baby yet. But the fact that she is holding the baby tenderly like that can already make the baby suffer less. So holding your pain with mindfulness, you don't know what is the root of your suffering yet. And yet holding like that can bring already some relief. And you feel better. That is why generating mindfulness and concentration and holding your pain is very important. You can suffer less, especially when you are surrounded by brothers and sisters in the Dharma who can help you uh, to do the same. And after having hold the baby for a few minutes, the mother can discover what is wrong with the baby and she can fix the situation very easily. After having hold our pain, our sorrow, our mindfulness and concentration may bring about some insight as what is the roots of this sorrow and fear. And we begin to understand the nature of our pain, our sorrow. Understanding will bring compassion and will show us the way in order to transform. And that is the object of uh, other exercises that follow. But for the seven and the eight exercise is only to recognize the pain, the sorrow, and to embrace tenderly with the energy of mindfulness and concentration. We shall continue tomorrow. <laughs>